This is the land where the sea and the sky meet to create the most mysterious picture. A land of icebergs and glaciers, pristine snow-clad mountains, and wildlife of epic proportion. This is Antarctica. But before we delve into the magic and mystery of this otherworldly landscape, let's go to where the journey begins, in the southern city of Ushuaia, Argentina. I'm on a voyage to one of the most remote places on the planet, Antarctica. This giant continent covered in ice is my seventh and final continent to visit. And to get there, I'm on an expedition style ship called the Ocean Albatross. We'll be taking two full days at sea across the Drake Passage, which is one of the most rough ocean crossings in the world. And I cannot wait to see the glaciers, the ice and the penguins. Thank you so much to Viva Expeditions for hosting me on this trip. I've just left Ushuaia and we are cruising down the Beagle Channel past the southern coast of Chile and Argentina as we make our way out into open ocean on our way to Antarctica. It's night one. We have just left the Beagle Channel and are hitting the open ocean and that means the boat is starting to sway. As you can see, this is where we are right now, just in the middle of nowhere. And this is when I think most people are taking their Dramamine and trying to get some sleep. Well, it's not quite morning yet, it's 3.30 in the morning, and I was told that the sun might be up around this time, but we are right now in the midst of the Drake Passage, and it is definitely wavy, just getting my sea legs, and hopefully we'll see the sun coming up soon. The Drake Passage is where three oceans meet. So not only does it have some serious currents from the Pacific, Atlantic, and Southern Oceans, but it can also have some serious weather. Luckily, our trip across the Drake was relatively smooth, what they call the Drake Lake, but it still took some getting used to. We have officially left the Drake Passage and are in Antarctic waters. There are many more birds around the ships. There's been some whale sightings and right behind me is an iceberg, our first one of the trip and there are going to be many, many more along the way. Before every outing out into the outdoors here, you've got to get ready, which means putting on a lot of extra layers, waterproof pants, waterproof jackets, boots, which luckily they provide, which are gonna keep my feet nice and warm and dry. And after I put these on, I've got to throw on a life vest because I'm getting in a skiff to take me to land. And that means I could go overboard at any time. And in these kinds of waters, you definitely don't want to do that. This is not an easy feat getting all these layers on. One thing I've added to is actually some heated socks because I get really cold when I'm out in the elements. So heated socks, lots of layers, definitely essential for me.
I have made landfall here in the South Shetland Islands, which is a large chain of islands right before you get to the actual continent of Antarctica. And there's a large, diverse amount of wildlife here. Right behind me, there is both a Weddell seal and a leopard seal. Leopard seals you rarely see on land. They're the top predator here in Antarctica. And there's a lot of penguins behind me too. On this island, there are two different kinds. We can see Gentoo and Chinstrap penguins as well. Of the 17 penguin species in the world, there are eight species of penguin that live between the tip of South America and Antarctica. Gentoo penguins, which can be seen in great numbers along this shoreline, are the third largest penguins and also one of the scarcest, with just 300,000 mating pairs believed to be in the wild. I am here in the mating and nesting season, so many of the penguins can be seen making skyward trumpeting movements, which is a gesture to females looking for a mate. It's just incredible being surrounded by all these penguins here, and they are so cute. I've dreamed of coming to this place for so long, but I'm going to leave these guys behind because we're going to head up the hill over to the penguin colony where we should see some nesting birds. We are at the nesting site now where you can see there are dozens of penguins back here, mostly Gen 2 penguins that are hoping to be moms and dads of little penguin chicks. Gen 2 penguins live in large and lively breeding colonies and use small stones to make nests, which male penguins will often give as a courtship gift to a hopeful female penguin. And I thought this was so adorable. Gen 2 penguin females usually lay two eggs and they take just over a month to hatch. The men and the women help each other out by sitting on the nest and these penguins also usually mate for life. One of the other penguin species on this island is the chinstrap penguin, which are pretty easy to identify. I'll let you give it a guess. These penguins are one of the most abundant in the world. They eat fish and krill, and so, like other penguin species, are affected by climate change. And many of the scientists that work here in Antarctica are studying this exact thing. Now, the chinstrap penguins are also one of the funniest because they slide around on the ice on their stomachs, propelling themselves along with their feet. The South Shetlands are just 65 nautical miles from the Antarctic Peninsula. They contain 11 islands and are full of a large variety of wildlife. Penguins, seals, and dozens of species of birds. I will be back here to these islands to see a few more of these critters in a few days, but the next stop is off to the Antarctic Peninsula. My first day on land, I severely underestimated how cold it would be. Not yet acclimated to the Arctic conditions, I was frigid exploring the penguin colonies, but definitely learned to dress a bit more warmly for the next outing the following day. Skiff rides are one of the best and most beautiful experiences here, and each and every one offers something entirely different. Today's ride took us up close with an old shipwreck from the whaling days in the early 20th century. Further exploration took us close to colonies of cormorants, also known as Antarctic shag, which have piercing blue eyes and are excellent swimmers. We also spotted a lone Adelie penguin, rare in this part of the peninsula, as they live much farther south on the continent itself. This guy was far from home and quite possibly lost. I hope he finds his way back home. Well, welcome to summer in Antarctica. <laughs> it is snowing again here. And this is actually the only time that you can travel by sea to this continent during its summer months, which go from about October to March. And the weather is not summer-like like it is in much of the world because this continent is almost completely covered in ice. And in just a few moments, I'm gonna be stepping foot on the actual landmass of Antarctica itself. All day we've been cruising up these icy straits, making our way here from the South Shetland Islands, getting to get up close with some of these icebergs. Some of the most amazing ones are just this 
amazing color of blue that is just even so hard to describe. And these icebergs are actually some of the oldest icebergs that you can see floating in the sea. It's official, I am on my seventh continent. Welcome everybody to Antarctica. As an explorer, it is really special coming here. This is my last and final continent and it's at the literal end of the earth too. I have a lot of exploring that I'm gonna be doing here. Now, this continent is actually the fifth largest continent on earth, so it's really big. The United States, the lower 48 states that is, would fit inside this continent one and a half times. So it's not something that you can explore in full. And even the scientists that live here don't get to do that. But I am gonna be doing a lot of fun adventures. We're gonna be snowshoeing. I'm gonna be kayaking through some of these icebergs. And I'm even gonna be spending a long cold night sleeping on the snow. Antarctica is actually the only continent on Earth where you won't find any countries. This entire landmass is actually designated as a nature reserve, the largest one on the planet. That's because 54 countries have now come together to sign the Antarctic Treaty. And there is no drilling here. There is strict regulations about what can and can't be done. Most of the people that live here, especially year round, are actually scientists that are studying all kinds of things from the ice to the wildlife. And it's really special that tourists are allowed to come here because those are the two types of things that can be done here, scientific research and tourism. But with that comes a lot of strict regulations. Every day when we get off the ship, we have to go through what's called biosecurity. We have to actually dip our boots in a solution that has antibacteria. And when we get back on board, we have to do the same thing, scrubbing off anything that we might have picked up from Antarctica and brought onto the ship. This is because this landscape is so pristine and it is the one place on the planet where man really hasn't screwed it up yet. There are no invasive species here, no invasive wildlife as well, or plants. And all these countries are really trying to keep it that way. That makes this a biosphere, a perfect window into the past where nothing has been contaminated. So you can actually figure out some of the clues that answer a lot of scientific questions relating to climate and our Earth's history. Getting to play in the snow here in Antarctica was a rare treat. In the last few months, the avian flu has spread like wildfire throughout the world. It had yet to reach these far removed islands and areas in the Antarctic region. So tour operators and scientists are taking extra precautions by making sure humans don't accidentally spread the disease. This area was chosen for a snow day because of its lack of wildlife, which means we wouldn't accidentally put any wildlife in danger by being in the snow. In all the other areas we visited, kneeling, laying down, or placing objects on the ground would not be allowed, as this might put penguins and other wildlife in danger. This is certainly a fun way to spend the day in Antarctica, but it definitely makes me think about the explorers that came here in the early 1900s, like Shackleton, and tried to make it to the South Pole. They had basic equipment. They brought dogs and ponies, which didn't survive long, and ended up just trekking across the snow with sleds that they actually pulled themselves. You know, the snow is so deep here, you fall in super easily just one step after another. It would be such a slow slog trying to get across the snow. And they were trying to go hundreds of miles into the interior of this really inhospitable landscape. You can see that even in the summertime here, the visibility can be close to zero. The temperatures are very, very cold. And to not have GPS or any sort of new age technology, trying to reach a place so far away in conditions like this seems nearly impossible.
it may be summer here in Antarctica, but the water here is still really cold. And as it snows more and more, the snow is actually accumulating on the surface of the water because the snow is actually warmer than the water itself. And one of the really cool things that you can see here in just this little area here is just how the sea ice forms out to sea. If I stick my finger through here, I'm going right through water on the top, a membrane of ice, and then right through. And you can actually see where I put my fingers in this little area. It's just really cool to see how the ice forms. And in the winter time here, what happens is basically the sea ice forms pack ice and it actually expands the landmass of Antarctica more than 100 times, making it completely impassable to reach here by sea. Antarctica is roughly 5.2 million acres of land. More than 98% of it is covered in ice, and much of that continental land is actually pushed underneath the ocean from the weight of all the ice and snow, which contains 70% of the Earth's fresh water. The peninsula is located around 800 miles from the southern shores of South America, which means a lot of your time is spent in transit. Even on a 10-day cruise, you will merely scratch the surface of this massive continent. And if you want to set foot on land like I am today, you'll need to go on a small ship. Cruises with more than 500 people on board are actually not allowed to have any passengers disembark onto the continent itself. This helps keep wildlife and the landscapes protected. My advice, the smaller the better. Ships with less than 200 passengers will give you the best experience and the most options for getting off the ship. Plus, it's better for the environment to be in smaller groups when exploring this natural nature reserve. Returning safely to the ship, I most enjoyed the evenings on deck, watching the changing of the light, fog, and floating icebergs pass us by as the daylight slowly faded to blue hour and an ethereal twilight during these long days of summer. With almost 24 hours of light, evenings here were otherworldly. When the sun dipped to the horizon, you were often left with cloud inversions that almost touched the fog-covered ocean. Devoid of almost all color in this nightless night, it was like sailing through a black and white movie. Mornings were just as spectacular and each day a surprise to see just where and what I would see from the balcony as I looked out into the snow-covered spectacle of this place. Right now we're cruising into a place called Paradise Bay and it is absolutely beautiful. There are a couple of research stations in this area and we're going to be visiting one of them which is actually owned by the country of Argentina. This is Brown Station, one of Argentina's many research stations. This is actually a summer station, so scientists will get here in about a month, mid-January, and spend a couple of months doing research on penguins and some climatology as well. Now, a fun fact about this station is that actually back in 1984, one of the lead scientists that was here was asked to stay on for the winter, and he actually went mad. He burned down the entire station. Speculation is, that's why this is just a summer station now. It's pretty easy to see why they call this place Paradise Bay. Coming up here from the research station, you have these just absolutely spectacular views in every direction of this bay. And if you sit quietly for a while, you can actually hear snow and ice falling off some of the glaciers that surround it. It is just absolutely mesmerizing. I've been to a lot of places around the world, seen mountains and glaciers from the east to the west all around the earth, but this place is like something I have never seen before, and I can see why people want to come back time and time again. I 
Antarctica is home to 70 permanent research bases, owned by 30 countries, housing upwards of 1,200 people in the busier summer season. If you're really wanting to get away from it all, you can apply to be one of these workers. No science experience required. Brown Station's location in Paradise Harbor was also one of my favorite places for a skiff tour. With fields of frozen blue icebergs, crystal clear waters, this protected inlet would be the perfect fit for a snow globe. Hooverville Island has one of the largest Gen 2 penguin colonies on the peninsula, home to thousands of birds and some very well-maintained penguin highways. As people, penguins always get the right of way and it is extremely important to not force any of these animals to have to change their course or their behavior because of us. So stepping in these highways was strictly frowned upon, but observing from a safe distance was encouraged and highly entertaining too. While most penguins walked in the highways, some penguins would choose to forego them and slide on their bellies to the water. The clear waters here also provided some of the best views of penguins swimming and gathering on the shorelines. We wouldn't stray far from these protected inlets on the western side of the peninsula. Even moving the ship an hour one way or another offered so many different things to see and experience. When I woke up this morning, I was in one of the most spectacular places I've ever seen. It's, it's hard to describe what it looks like here because it's just unlike any other place on earth. We are cruising right now to a place called Port LaCroix, but when I opened the window this morning, we were just parked in the middle of the bay here. The sea was completely flat and it was like we were in a dreamscape, almost like parked on an ice skating rink with reflections of the mountains on every side. 
It's just blowing me away how beautiful it is here. And I definitely didn't expect that. I didn't expect to see so much variety in landscapes, so much variety in the mountains. And, you know, this is our first really blue sky day, but many of the days have had this kind of fog and cloud inversions that hang and get stuck on the tops of the mountains. It's such a spectacular place. And I cannot wait to see what the day brings. Today was also the day I would see just how cold the icy waters of Antarctica really are. It's time for the polar plunge. This was my last activity on the Antarctic Peninsula. A beautiful day, passing by Gentoo penguin colonies where I couldn't help but feel the struggle of the long journey these penguins had to get up and down the hill to the sea. With the colonies far up this snowy bank and a very steep walk, there was a lot of falling down and getting up observed. I think a penguin chairlift would be much appreciated. The history of Antarctica is rather dark. Years of sealing and whaling that almost extinguished several species of bird, seal, and whale. And this next island was ground zero for many years of that history. Right now I am kayaking in a place called Deception Island. This is back in the South Shetland Islands and it's a really great place for wildlife as the water and the temperature here are a little bit warmer because we're actually paddling inside the caldera of an active volcano. There is an old whaling station here as well, and this place is actually called Whaler's Bay. This is definitely a really unique place to kayak. Not only are there penguins and lots of seabirds, but there's also this sulfur that is just rising off the edges here of the ground and the water, and it's just really unique.
Deception Island isn't just a great place to spot wildlife. It's also got a lot of history when we talk about early Antarctica. Now, the first people that came here were actually sealers and whalers. And this island in particular had sealers in the early 1800s that came here pretty much decimated most of the fur seal population. Then many decades later, whalers came here. They set up most of what we see here today. Huge vats for oils. There are some ovens over to my left here where they melted down the whale blubber. And there's some old homes and other buildings that all of those employees would have used. There's even an old cemetery here. And because this is an active volcano, in the late 60s, there was actually an eruption here that pretty much wiped out most of the historical houses and other remnants that remained from the whaling days. But there are still a few things that you can come here and see. It's a dark history and one that I'm glad doesn't happen anymore here in Antarctica because of the Antarctic Treaty. Whales and all of the marine life around this continent are now protected. There are quite a few species of seal here in the Antarctic waters, and one I recognize from home in California is the elephant seal. Right now I'm at a place called Elephant Point here in the South Shetland Islands. This place was actually named after these seals specifically. In California we have a different species, but I definitely recognize them. There's a lot of adolescents here, some pups, and a couple mothers with their young ones too, and of course, plenty of penguins. The elephant seal is the largest seal, getting their name from their massive size and the bulbous appendage on the male seal's head. These male seals can weigh between 3,000 and 8,000 pounds, so this one on the beach is just a youngster. While females may top out at less than 2,000 pounds, the size difference here is pretty massive. My favorite ones, however, were the pups who are especially cute and very hungry, spending about three weeks nursing from mom before learning the ins and outs of elephant seal life in the water. My time on this island was short. With weather coming in, it was time to get back on the ship and bid farewell to this land of ice and fog. It is my last night cruising here along the Antarctic Peninsula. Tomorrow I head back up the Drake Passage and to the southern end of South America. This trip has just <laughs> blown my mind. I had no idea what Antarctica had to offer, and I certainly didn't expect it would have the stunning landscapes, the glaciers, the icebergs, and the wildlife that I have seen over this last week. I can see why so many countries fought to protect this place as the largest nature reserve in the world for science and for wildlife. And I hope you enjoyed coming on this expedition with me. I cannot wait to show you what's coming up in the next adventure. Thank you as always for joining me. I'm Alice Ford and never stop exploring.